and services continue each Wednesday at 6 on Facebook Live. We've had a pretty good couple of first sessions, um, and I think we'll stick with the same format this week. Um, and uh, I, it's, I appreciate everybody putting up with me just at my talking head. So I'm looking forward to when we can get together in more of a fellowship setting and we can just talk. Um, the women of faith are, uh, are framing Lutheran pastors. <laughs> um, framing their pictures. Um, and if you would like to frame a pastor uh, or reframe a pastor, um, please make a note of the announcement in the bulletin. It's $34 and you can mark your check or envelope accordingly. Um, and we are also, most importantly, having communion today. Um, so when we get to the appropriate place, people will uh, be distributing the packets. And just make sure that you have a packet. And if you don't, uh, just flag somebody down and we'll, we'll take care of it. I'd rather this be, you know, perhaps a little bit awkward, but done. And, because we haven't done this in quite a while. And in fact, I've probably forgotten how to do it, so please bear with me. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other announcements to make this morning? Just a brief, just a brief one. Okay, Tony. Uh, choir members, and we will start choir back this Wednesday night at 7.30 if you feel comfortable to come. So if you're a choir member, look for an email from me today. Uh, I'd like to start planning something for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. So if, if you want to be a choir member, 7.30, Wednesday night in the choir room. If you're a handbell member, meet Daisy. Or if you just like to be a handbell member, uh, meet Daisy after the service. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Randall. Oh, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Any, anybody else? All right. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please stand as you are able. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, consider the worthy desires of your humble servants. Reach out to defend us from evil by the word and work of your powerful right hand. Grant this, we pray, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Let's have the little Lutherans up here. And I know there's some of you here, so if you don't come, I'm going to come to you. Yeah, I won't hurt you. I know it's kind of scary, all this, all this stuff, but I won't hurt you. I may bore you, but I won't hurt you. All right. What do we got? A broom. What else? Paper towels. I forgot to bring a mop. There's three of you, and I've only got two. One of y'all have to be the supervisor, I reckon. Now, what do we do with these things? What do, what do we use those things for? No, they, they, yeah, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> what do you use them for, Pastor? You what now? That's right. You sweep with the broom. You can wipe with the paper towels, and you can mop with the mop. So, uh, so let's see how good you are at cleaning. Everybody, stand up. Now, when I hold up the broom, I want you to show me how you sweep the floor, okay? And when I hold up the paper towels, I want you to show me how well you can. Scrub the window. Okay? You ready? Come on, we're going to be here a long time before that gets clean if you do it like that. All right. Sweep away. All right, now what? Now scrub the window. Scrub the window. Right now, some of your parents are thinking about Karate Kid. Show me sweep the floor. Sweep the floor. Scrub the window. Sweep the floor. Sweep the floor. Sweep the floor. Sweep it some more. Scrub the window and sweep the floor. Okay. I, I can tell that you guys have a lot of experience with cleaning. Y'all can sit down. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for playing along. Um, all right. So how do we know when it's time to clean up? When it's a mess. Maybe when your feet stick to the floor when you walk through the kitchen. Or when your mother can't find you when she comes to wake you up in the morning? <laughs> it's, everybody does it. Everybody does it. When someone writes, wash me please, on the car. Have y'all ever had that happen? I have. Uh, or when there are no dishes left in the cabinet or tumbleweeds under the, under the sofa. You, you get the idea. Now, Jesus did some house cleaning too one time. Do y'all know about that? Do you know when Jesus cleaned house? He didn't clean it with a mop and a broom. Do you know what he did? We're we'll going to hear about it in just a minute. Who knows what Jesus did to clean house? He made a whip. And what else? And he, and he turned over the tables. And what else? And he ran all the money changers out of the temple. We're going to hear about that in just a minute. And that happened at a Jewish festival called Passover. And Passover was a festival that, that in a nutshell, celebrated when the Jewish people escaped from Egypt, where they were slaves. And that is a long story that starts in the Old Testament with a man named Joseph, and it's pretty good. I'd recommend it. Um, and so when Jesus went to the temple at Passover, he saw all these people, and they were selling doves and sheep and cattle. Do you know why they were selling them? They were selling them to, as sacrifices. So you went to the temple to make your sacrifice to God, and these people were selling animals to make the sacrifice with. And we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in the sermon in a minute, a little bit more about that. But can you imagine going to church and somebody selling T-shirts and coffee mugs and things like that during the, during the service? It'd be a little bit like, like a flea market, wouldn't it? Have you ever been to a flea market? No? Man, you're missing out. All right. Well, you'll get to go at some point. 
But it sounds kind of like a circus, doesn't it? With a lot of stuff going on and it's hard to concentrate and think about worship. So Jesus got pretty mad about this. And he starts throwing around the tables and he ran all the dealers off. And he says, what are you doing? He says, this is a place of worship. It's not a store. So why do you think he might do that? Anybody want to take a guess at it? One reason? You don't know? I love honesty. I don't know. A lot of times I don't know either. Well, one reason that he might have done that is he didn't want people to think of God as somebody that you can get to like you or take care of you just because you go through the motions, okay? Just because you say and do the right things isn't necessarily what God wants you to do for all that you need. We'll talk about that some more in a minute. But I also think he wanted, us to, he wanted to remind us that sometimes our hearts need to be cleansed as well, not just the floors mopped and scrubbed, but sometimes our hearts need to do that. And during Lent, we talk a lot about cleaning our hearts out, right? Um, and we don't do it with a mop or a broom. We do that by what? Does anybody know there, there, there are, I think, uh, two things I can think of that you clean your heart, that you used to cleanse your heart. Can you, do you know, anybody know what they are? Anybody at all want to take a shot at it? Repentance is good. What else? Confession. Meditation. Confession. Prayer. I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking of prayer. And I'm thinking of studying scripture. So we can do that. And so we kind of got at it. When you repent and confess and you pray, all that involves studying the Bible, right? So you read the Bible and you pray to God a lot. And you can pray to God anytime or any place. And you can tell him anything you want. If you're angry, you can say you're angry. If you're happy, you can say you're happy. You can ask why people get into trouble. You can ask why people get sick and die. And God will always answer you. I mean, he may not give you the answer you think you're going to hear, and he may not do it right away, but he will always answer you. And you can say, dear God, or dear Jesus, or dear Holy Spirit, and you can tell him whatever you want. And you can also talk to your parents, and you can also talk to me, and we will all help you hear what God has to say back to you. And most of you can talk to your teachers, too. Um, and the more you pray, the more you sweep the dust out of your spirit and keep yourself clean and fresh and open to God. Did any of that make sense? Okay, good. I see some nods. I see some nods. Good deal. All right. Why don't we have a prayer? Ready? Do you want to repeat after me or just want me to read it? Yeah, I know what you... Well, let's repeat it. I know. They're like, I'll take the French fries instead of the broccoli. Okay. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. remind us always... That we, are your temple, that we are your temple and that your spirit lives in us, and that your lives in us. Because, of because of the resurrection of your son. Help us keep our hearts clean, us keep our hearts clean and, prepared and prepared for our service to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. That wasn't too bad, was it? They're both looking at me like, we're, we're not so sure yet. Let's wait another week and see how it goes. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you can stay there if you like, yeah. first reading is from Exodus chapter 20. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting, visiting the inequity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant your, or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. The word of the Lord. Please read responsibly Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells his tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the day to the and runs about to the end of the Nothing is hidden from the eternity, but everything is revealed to the children of men. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them here is great reward. Above all, Keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, will my strength and my redeeming. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But, uh, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly, worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish to the world, foolish in the world, to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ, who became, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of the Lord. Gospel of 
according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And I am reading the NRSV version, so it's a little different from what you have. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, and also the sheep and the cattle. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away from here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated. To legions of otherwise reasonable people, it's the conflict that surpasses all others. It is us or them. It is the locals against the outsiders. It's the populists against the elitists. It's the alignment of the good in a holy war against the forces of evil. And I'm talking, of course, about the UNC Duke basketball game. <laughs> now, I know that some of you watched it. And I know some of you are rooting for the wrong team. But in, but, in case, but in case you are that rare creature who does not keep up with such things, last night's game in Chapel Hill was the 254th meeting of the two teams in one of the most intense sports rivalries in history. It is so intense that the second meeting, they, they play twice a year, and the second game, which was last night, uh, is always the last game of the regular ACC season, and it's one of the main reasons why the NCAA tournament brackets aren't published until it's concluded. Um, Carolina has the most wins overall, but out of the last 100 games, I think they've split 50-50 even. Um, it may be 51-50 now, but um, between 1949 and 2019, Carolina scored 13,581 points. Yes, I did look this stuff up. Um, 13,581 points against Duke and allowed 13,559. That's 22 points over 179 or 80 games. Jay Billis, who went to Duke and who is a sportscaster now, he called the game last night, said it's the greatest back and forth contest since the Peloponnesian War. So you can imagine, and I think he's right, so you can imagine, even if Carolina and Duke don't stir your soul, and even if this year neither team is really up to their usual uh, standards, you can imagine the frenzy uh, of activity that would take place in and around the sacred place, which for some is Cameron Indoor, and for others is the Dean Dome, and for still others, Carmichael Auditorium. And even though COVID has made this year an odd exception, normally, there's all kinds of things going on. There are TV trucks and trailers and buses and generators and miles of cable and satellite dishes and concession stands and long lines to the bathrooms. And most of all, under normal circumstances, there's this noise of tens of thousands of people, this roar and flash of this tense game being played. Now, imagine if someone outside, a landscaper, let's say, imagine if somebody outside cuts all the power cords at once with a gigantic pair of hedge trimmers. The scoreboard goes out, the lights go out, the cameras stop rolling, uh, the roar kind of dies away into a moment of confused silence, and then there's this scuffling and shuffling that begins as people wonder what to do and where to go next. This is exactly what happened last year when they stopped the tournament after it barely gotten started because of COVID. So we wouldn't say that this hedge trimmer or COVID had cleansed Cameron Indoor, much as we Carolina fans might like to cleanse Cameron Indoor, or the Dean Dome, but we would say that he had stopped the game. Uh, again, think back to the tournament last year, how it 
came ground to a sudden halt. We wouldn't say that COVID had cleansed the NCAA, but in the same way that you need a venue and vendors to run a basketball game, you need livestock and doves and money changers to run the Jewish temple in Jesus's time. The temple was the only place where it was permissible to worship God. You could learn about him in the local synagogue, but to worship, you had to go to Jerusalem. Um, and this required sacrifice, but it was often difficult to bring the livestock to the temple alive and healthy and especially unblemished from the more remote parts of the country. Some of those journeys would have taken days to complete. And so this market um, provided sacrifice to people who had traveled long distances. Jesus turns this over and he makes it impossible for people to buy the animals for the sacrifices that they're required to offer. He also makes it impossible for those who have come from all over the land to exchange their Roman coin for local currency to pay their required tithes. You couldn't pay the tithe with Roman money. It had to be with uh, Jewish money. Um, so Jesus stops the game, in other words. Why would he do that? If you're like me, you may have picked up somewhere that the problem in the marketplace was corruption, that people weren't just selling animals, they were cheating the poor in the process, and that's certainly possible. Um, significantly, this is one of few ev events um, that's recorded in all four Gospels. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus calls the marketplace a den of robbers, suggesting the corruption and that he raises this ruckus as a protest to clean things up. And that's, I'm not gonna debate that. I don't have a quibble with that, but John points out something interesting. John shows us something different. In, in, in his account, we don't see Jesus lashing out so much at corruption, or at least not only that. We also see him bringing the temple activity to a, a, a crushing halt to point to another holy place altogether. Destroy this temple, he says and I will raise it up again in three days. <clears throat> and as with other things, Jesus says in John, that statement doesn't necessarily follow from what just happened. Um, no one has said anything about destroying the temple. The people who hear him are confused. Does he think that he can put back together something in three days that they've been building for 40 plus years? They take him literally. But again, remember, the temple was the place appointed by God in the law to be his meeting place with mankind. It was where sacrifices were to be offered during festivals and at special times in life, honoring a birth or in thanksgiving for a harvest. That was where humanity and divinity were allowed to meet. It was where God was and you had to go there to get to him. It was the only holy place. But in Christ, that gets turned upside down. John begins his gospel with the confession that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through the birth of Jesus, God's dwelling place is now with humans as a human. Jesus is the word and the incarnation of what John calls grace upon grace. One could argue that in turning the marketplace upside down, Jesus is turning the whole system upside down that he is announcing the end of that way of relating to God. But I think he's trying to remind his people then and, and now too of something simpler, and that is that the temple isn't the only place to find God. God is no longer accessible only there. God is not something any building can contain. God is available everywhere. Consider the words of, uh, of Deuteronomy 30. Surely this word that I command you today is not too hard for, it, for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven and get it for us, that we may hear and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side for us and get it for us, so that we may hear and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. And Paul picks this up, um, especially in Romans 10, where he writes that we're saved when we believe the word in our, heart, in our hearts and confess it with our mouths. And this is as relevant for us 
21st century Christians as it was for the first century Jews. We continue to care just as they did about where our lives intersect with the divine. But we're just as guilty of looking for that intersection only here, only in the building and only among ourselves. Paul says we're saved by believing and confessing, but he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, but how is anyone to confess who has not believed? And how can they believe if they have not heard? And how are they to hear if <clears throat> someone does not tell them? Folks, the intersection of humanity and divinity is not in this building. It isn't in our rituals in this building. It isn't in the affirmation that we receive here. It's in that. It's in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Through that, God comes to us. We do not get to him, and we certainly don't get to him on our terms. Nor do we have to try. None of us has to ascend to heaven or cross the abyss. Through the cross, God comes to us on his terms. He destroys humanity's ways and means, and he rejects even our best and brightest efforts to explain him or experience him. His foolishness puts our wisdom to shame. He stops our game. Through the cross and the resurrection, he calls all people into a curious three-way relationship with him, a relationship between me and him, and you and him, and me and you. That's not grammatically correct, but I think you see where I'm going. It's a triangle of relationships, and you, you can't just have two sides of it. You've got to have all three. It ain't enough to buy a decent sacrifice in the temple. It ain't enough to sing blessed assurance and put your money in the plate. The crucifixion and resurrection are the divine actions that embarrass human vanity and yet embrace humanity itself. The gospel, the good news that we're called to share is that God lives among us yet. The word that was with God and which is God and which has now become flesh and has come onto the scene to reveal God, that God who spoke creation into being, that God who spoke to his people first through Moses and then through the prophets, that same God now speaks directly to us in our hearts and on our lips through his son, Jesus Christ. And that means that God is set loose on the world, present everywhere. And church cannot contain him any more than the temple could. This is not a marketplace where we transact pious business. This is a breakfast table where we receive in this hour of the week the nutrition we need to face the other 167 that we have to live out there. And that wonderful, as that wonderful banner in our sanctuary says when we pass through the narthex, you are now entering your mission field. So make it count. Go back to struggling to make good decisions for you and your family. Go back to working hard to balance the multiple roles that you play and go back to agonizing over how to make the most of your time and money. But do all that from the cross. Do those things not because church reminds you every week that you've been saved. In other words, do not do them so that everybody else can see what the cross has done for you as though you should be praised for something that you had nothing actually to do with, but do it so that they can see what it might do for them, so that they can see the divine thing that stops our human games, the thing that transcends the ways we isolate each other and the stupid things we do to ourselves and do to each other. Jesus Christ is here with us this morning, but not only here, he's out there ready for us to join him in helping all these other people wrestle with the same things that we wrestle with. This thing that we do each Sunday that we often think of as a destination is actually a, a point of origin. We are drawn here to encounter God in one way, a way that encourages us and feeds us in our faith, and that's important. But then it sends us back out into another kind of encounter. Jesus was baptized, but he was also driven into the wilderness. The intersection with God and the human condition is found in the cross, and the cross is found in community. We gather, we confess, we celebrate, and then we're commissioned, commissioned to take God everywhere, to find God in everything, 
rather than trying to bring it all here to where we are and where we expect him to be. Think of one place that you will be this week other than church. It could be at work or at school or at the store or even at a basketball game. It doesn't really matter where it is. Lift it up in prayer and ask God to open your eyes and put the words on your tongue when you come to that time and place. Ask him to show you how to partner with him in that intersection of the things of man and the righteousness of God. Amen. made us his people through our baptism in Christ, living together in trust and hope, let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power and the will of God, and died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, overturn our minds and pour out our hearts that we may not worship worldly things but follow you in wisdom, obedience, and devotion, ever grateful for what you have done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is through him that we are born anew. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, we pray for those who, because of their circumstances or situation in life, have neither seen your beauty in this world nor know who you are. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon your church that we may be a witness to you and do not let us take your beautiful and good creation for granted. Help us use all the good gifts you give us to care for all living things. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for wisdom and understanding for all those who teach your word. Protect them and guide them and move them with your Holy Spirit as they teach us to see the world as you see it. Make them whole through your word that we may better hear you through them. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, grant your people mercy in the midst of trials and doubt. Let them feel your presence and tender love during turbulent times. 
We pray for our brothers and sisters, including Kenny, Tina, Lois, Ginger, Kathleen, and Helen, and all those who have lost loved ones. We pray especially for our dear brother Ed, Lord. Ease his suffering and body and grant peace to his mind. Comfort Ed and Ruth with the presence of your spirit. We pray to you in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and it is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. for our fallen world you gave your only son that all those who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life we give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through jesus christ send now your holy spirit into our hearts that we may receive our lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper amen, amen. i'm lord jesus in the night in which he was betrayed our lord took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that through this Holy Communion we may know the unity we share with all your people, in the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay. Now, <clears throat> turn it over so the wafer is up. Does everybody have a packet? All right. And remove your wafer from your packet, as I say, the body of Christ given for you. Amen. And now turn it over and open the other side and take it, as I say, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your son both as a sacrifice for sin and as a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and keep you forever.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Jesus.